Um, welcome, all of you. Uh, my name is D David DeWitt, and I'm currently uh, the Vice President of Programs for the Center for International Governance Innovation. And uh, Jason and colleagues, is that better? That's better, OK. Uh, ask me uh, on their, their behalf uh, to welcome you here to uh, express our pleasure that this extraordinarily important topic has attracted uh, serious uh, scientists and participants um, in, that have concerns over climate change and governance issues uh, to come to join us over the next two days. Uh, the Center for International Governance Innovation, uh, for those of you who don't know, is um, an independent, nonpartisan think tank based in Waterloo, Ontario. And among its missions is to provide uh, support and opportunity uh, to researchers from many different disciplines to explore areas of critical concern, and in particular, to try and address issues which are emerging, which are likely to uh, make a difference uh, in uh, the future of humanity, and uh, that need to uh, have serious conversations around governance. But how do you address these issues? How do you manage the resources? How do you engage in serious, open-ended conversation? And how do you do so in ways that encourage uh, innovative thinking and respons responsible policy making. And uh, I understand from, uh, J from Jason and from s some of the work that he's uh, sent to me uh, to read, uh, and having had the opportunity to listen to a couple of outstanding scholars who presented on this, this topic a number of, of months ago at CG, um, that the issue of geoengineering and climate change um, is indeed one of those uh, topics that intersect uh, the challenge of science and, and, and public policy. So we're looking forward to um, not only the um, deliberations and the serious exchanges that will take place at this conference, but we're very much looking forward to the book that's going to emerge that uh, this conference has an opportunity to engage in, if you want, in draft form. That this is an opportunity for the authors to hear from serious colleagues, uh, and it's an opportunity for colleagues in the audience uh, from whatever disciplines uh, to really challenge and engage researchers who've given serious thought to an extraordinarily complex and important problem. Uh, so it's, uh, again, on behalf of CG, it's really a great pleasure to be able to sponsor this. I want to thank uh, the institutions that have willingly uh, supported this effort and those uh, who, with David Reynolds and Jason Blackstock, have uh, organized this meeting. So with that, let me invite Jason to the podium. David, thank you very much. Um, as David said, tonight marks the beginning of a conference that's going to last for two days. And it's going to be two days of deliberations between colleagues, scholars, and practitioners who've joined us from around the world, from uh, pretty much every continent except Antarctica, which it's kind of hard to get the penguins up here. Um, and the one main goal of this conference is actually to begin engaging the public even more on the topic of geoengineering. Geoengineering is a topic that's emerged over the last five years into the global climate conversation. And I won't go through much of the details because you're about to get a great introduction from Professor Rayner and the rest of the panel that's going to speak tonight. But it certainly has uh, been one that's emerged not only in the policy and scientific sphere, but in newspaper articles and magazine articles. And one of the main goals of this this conference is to produce, as David said, a book which will be accessible to policymakers, to practitioners, and publics to introduce all of the different ethical issues, the different political issues, the different governance issues that are raised by the emergence of geoengineering into the global climate sphere. So tonight, you're going to get the introduction first from uh, Professor Steve Rayner of Oxford, who will give you an overview of what geoengineering is, what the issues are involved, and sort of the motivations behind the conference. You'll then hear from a, a distinguished international panel 
who have different perspectives to bring to the table around these emerging technologies. Badisha Banerjee, a Dalai Lama Fellow, joining us from the US tonight. Arunaba Ghosh, uh, CEO of India's Center for Energy, Environment, and Water, a nonprofit think tank. And Steve Hamburg, the chief scientist of the Environmental Defense Fund, each of whom have written and published and debated about geoengineering over the last few years. Um, just before turning it over to Steve, I did want to take a couple of minutes to just acknowledge all of the institutions that made this possible. As David pointed out, the Center for International Governance Innovation, where I've been for the past couple of years, uh, is the sponsor of this event. And it is one of these sorts of emerging global governance issues that CG has been covering so well. Here locally, the uh, Canadian International Council and uh, the Institute for Science, Society and Policy at the University of Ottawa are our local partners and hopefully we're, many of you represent those institutions or were invited by those institutions here tonight. Um, the other institutions who are joining us in partnering in, in setting up this conference and, and running the content of it include uh, Oxford University, the Oxford Martin School, and the Institute for Science Society and uh, Science Innovation and Society, um, the Center for Energy, Environment, and Water from India, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, all of whom uh, engage the interface between science and public policy, particularly around climate change, uh, from a variety of different uh, directions directions and we're very uh, happy to have their participation and help with organizing this conference. So if I could just get a round of applause for the organizations that made this possible. So without further ado, let me introduce the keynote talk for the evening from Professor Steve Rayner of Oxford. Now, Professor Rayner is the director of the James Martin uh, Institute for uh, Science, Innovation, and Society, as well as uh, uh, one of the co-directors of the new Geo Oxford Geoengineering Program, which is based out of the James Martin School. Um, Steve has contributed to the global climate discourse in a huge number of ways, including editing uh, one of the major collected works on uh, human choice and climate change that uh, has been instrumental in shaping some of this field as well. So without further ado, Steve, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I love that expression, without further ado. It implies there's been some ado already, doesn't it? Uh, whatever that is. Climate geoengineering governance. Uh, Jason asked me to basically do the geoengineering 101 talk, uh, which I will execute as dutifully as I can, uh, and it basically comes in five sections. Firstly, what is climate geoengineering? Secondly, why might we even want to think about doing climate geoengineering? Thirdly would be, how might we actually implement climate geoengineering from a technical point of view? What are the kinds of things we're already worried about and we ought to be worried about? And finally, what are some of the th ways in which we might think about how best to govern it? Okay, so that's basically uh, 30 minutes in a nutshell. So what is climate geoengineering? Uh, it was defined by a working group of the Royal Society, which I had the privilege to uh, sit on uh, in 2009, as the deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. Now, one of the interesting things about this definition, by the way, is the presence of the word anthropogenic there, because one of the things about geoengineering actually is you could use it to counteract natural climate change. And if you think about some of the debates that have been going on politically in certain parts of the world, not far from here, um, about uh, whether or not climate change is happening, and certainly about whether it's anthropogenically caused, um, the fact that here you've got something which says basically, look, if the world's warming, there are some ways we can counteract at least part of that warming, uh, I think is of uh, particular interest. First thing I want to say about it, though, is that it's not an entirely novel idea. If you go back to the middle of the 19th century, there was a fellow uh, in the uh, large country that borders to this one to the south here, uh, a guy called James Pollard Espy, who proposed to the US federal government that it should buy up woodlots across the United States that it could set fire to, to induce rain. Um, this was one of a number of ideas that came around that in the 19th century about how to adjust the weather and the, and the climate in parts of the US. Um, as you actually had the big progress west across to the Great Plains. Uh, some of you may recall the slogan, the rain follows the plow. The idea there was that actually, uh, as you plowed the prairies, uh, this would release moisture from the soil, which would then form cl clouds, and that this would actually induce rainfall and make a much wetter climate uh, than people encountered when they first, uh, first went there. 
So uh, weather modification, climatic modification, was already around in the 19th century. In this century, it's been widely practiced in China. Uh, and there are, for example, um, uh, agricultural districts in Texas uh, today who regularly pay uh, for cloud seeding activities to try to moderate the weather. But perhaps even more interesting than those is that the fact that when climate change first came to the attention of the President of the United States in a report in 1965 from the President's Science Advisory Council, if you go and look at this, the only measures in that report that are discussed for counteracting climate change are what we would today call geoengineering measures. There's nothing in there about in reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and there's nothing in there about adaptation. It's all about ge geoengineering. So between 1965 to 2006, we had a period in which basically this approach to climate change just completely dropped off the map. And it came back to prominence with an article initially by Paul Critson, the Nobel Prize winning scientist in uh, climatic change in 2006, followed by one in science in 2007, in which Crutzen basically expressed the, uh, the frustration felt by a lot of scientists that international negotiations on climate change were going nowhere fast, uh, and that therefore we needed to think about other measures uh, other than uh, globally coordinated emissions reductions for dealing with climate. And that was really the origin of the current interest or revival of interest uh, in climate geoengineering. Now, why would we even think about doing this? The first question, I think, the first thing to say here is the world is actually nowhere near meeting any kind of mitigation targets. Uh, just to illustrate that, uh, most of you will be probably familiar with this graph. Uh, it is, of course, the IPCC uh, emissions scenarios. Uh, and these chart along the horizontal axis time, the next century, and on the vertical axis, the expected temperature rise from various different uh, scenarios of technical and economic development over the course of the century. And you can see here, basically, that depending on the, the assumptions you make about what technology is going to be available and when uh, and what levels of economic growth and development you're going to get in the world, you have a potential temperature range uh, for an increase in temperature by the end of the century between one degree and something getting very close to six degrees. Now, the bad news uh, is that we are actually on the top of this curve with global emissions increasing in real terms by about 3% three, uh, 3 per annum. So we're headed up to the top there. So we're certainly not um, uh, anywhere close to meeting our mitigation targets. That's the bad news. The even worse news um, is that those mitigation targets may be dangerously optimistic because all of those scenarios that you saw just now incorporate uh, two assumptions. They incorporate the assumption of a declining rate of carbon intensity per unit of global GDP and a declining rate of energy intensity <laughs> per unit of global GDP. Now, that was a trend that went on for about 100 years until a couple of years ago when it stopped and is now inflected. And at the time, I'm um, afraid some of my colleagues on the IPCC uh, were rather r quick to suggest that this was just a blip. Um, I think most of us are now fairly convinced that this isn't actually an inflection and it is, of course, the emergence uh, of the enormous economic expansion of China uh, and India. And if you, in fact, take out the assumed uh, carbon reduction that you get in all of those IPCC scenarios from that reduced declining energy and uh, carbon intensity, you can see that we don't have to reduce emissions over the next century just by the red amount on that graph there, which is uh, the IPCC's position, but also by the dark blue and light blue amounts as well. In other words, the challenge of the mitigation uh, enterprise uh, that we're facing may be much, much bigger uh, than we are currently recognizing. There's another concern, uh, and that's the idea that geoengineering could be used to shave off either temperature or greenhouse gas emissions concentration peaks. Uh, the idea being that if at some point in, this, in the course of the next century, uh, those peak, those go above levels, whatever level you choose to believe is, is, is so-called safe um, or not unacceptably dangerous anyway. Uh, the idea is that you could uh, uh, shave the peaks of those by using these geoengineering techniques uh, whilst you're using a conventional mitigation uh, to reduce greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. I should emphasize 
here that I think that nobody I have encountered uh, in the last few years in discourses, serious discourses about climate geoengineering believes that uh, geoengineering is a substitute for conventional mitigation. Uh, at best, it will be, uh, if it's helpful at all, it will be a supplementary tool uh, to efforts to reduce global greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. I've already mentioned uh, the notion that uh, we could use uh, geoengineering as a technical fix to sidestep the mitigation impasse. This was Crutzen's motivation. Uh, that may be true to a limited extent, but clearly, uh, given what I've just said, uh, I personally don't believe uh, that that is a viable uh, alternative uh, to reducing emissions overall. Another reason why we might think about it is to do carbon arbitrage. Uh, it may well be that we can take carbon out of the atmosphere. That's one of the methods I'll talk about shortly. Uh, uh, at places that are quite far away from uh, the places where we're putting carbon into the atmosphere. It's very hard to think about the alternative technology to the jet engine. The re it's, that is the one technology, really, uh, th for which there is no viable technical alternative on the horizon. And you certainly can't put a carbon capture device on the back of a jet engine because it will cease to be a jet engine for obvious reasons. So dealing with those uh, kinds of uh, emissions, they're only about two, uh, between 2 and 3% at the moment, but they are rising. Um, uh, maybe one of the uses for uh, carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. Another is non-point source emissions. And non-point source emissions actually are a substantial fraction of global emissions, much more than those from aircraft. Uh, and it would be useful to have some way to tackle those. Um, the next reason is one uh, which seems to some people slightly paradoxical. Uh, but as, of course, we uh, make some progress, at least, on taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by burning less fossil fuel and emitting uh, less in the way of flue gases uh, into the atmosphere, we're also taking out of the atmosphere the uh, particulate aerosols that accompany those emissions. And those particular aerosols at the moment actually have a cooling effect. So ironically, as we improve our efforts to take carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere, to, to reduce emissions by conventional means, uh, we may actually be uh, causing a bit of an extra warming effect. And one of the things we might think about is using geoengineering to counter that additional warming effect. The second to last one here is a very controversial one, uh, I think. Um, and it's something which is very hard to, to document, but it's certainly an impression that I've had, which is there are some people, I think, who are advocating geoengineering precisely because they think it's scary. And they think that by advocating it, that they will, in a sense, scare or encourage uh, people to engage in conventional greenhouse gas emissions reduction uh, activity that they're currently reluctant to do in order to avoid this big, hairy uh, technological intervention in global systems. And finally, of course, we shouldn't overlook the fact uh, that there are people who have a commercial interest, uh, who think that actually there is money to be made out of developing these technologies. So you have a whole range of uh, potential reasons uh, why one might want to engage in climate geoengineering activity. <laughs> How might we do it? Um, I'm not a, uh, uh, an engineer, and I'm not a natural scientist. I'm a social scientist. Um, but this is my sort of rather simplistic take on uh, how we might do it, and that is that there are two things that we can do, and there's two ways we can do both of those things. The two things we can do is, one is we can actually reflect some of the sun's energy back away from the planet, uh, and the other is we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And we can do both of those things, either by enhancing natural earth system processes, or if you don't like the term enhancing, you might say tinkering with natural earth system processes, and the other is by more traditional uh, black box engineering. And if you put these together, uh, you get the sort of this handy uh, mnemonic two by two matrix. Um, so for example, one could remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, by enhancing plankton growth. The idea here is that there are certain parts of the oceans that are iron deficient. If you added iron to those parts of the ocean, uh, you would have plankton blooms. Fish would come along and eat the plankton and the fish poop would then sink to the bottom of the ocean, and hey, presto, you've sequestered carbon. Uh, interesting idea. Actually, the Germans and the uh, Indians did an experiment with this a couple of years ago. It sort of worked. The first part worked. Anyway, they got the plankton bloom, but unfortunately, the plankton got eaten by jellyfish, which have light floaty poop, and the carbon went back into the atmosphere. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, they were getting halfway there. <laughs> 
If you want to do um, reflecting sunlight back or solar radiation management by enhancing natural processes, you might think about putting sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. Why do I call that enhancing a natural process? Because volcanoes do it. And in fact, we know, for example, from uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption, for about, this is a, a bit of a, a rough approximation, but for about a couple of years after that, there was about a two degree um, uh, moderation in the global average uh, temperatures. So we know that, you, that actually aerosols can have this cooling effect. We know, in fact, that the uh, human uh, emitted aerosols that we put in the atmosphere at the moment have some cooling effect. So we might decide to do that deliberately. There's lots of ways you could get those aerosols up there. You could spray them from planes. Um, uh, you could uh, fire them from old World War II naval cannon if you designed a dispersant shell properly and, and just stuck those things firing up into the atmosphere. And I'll show you a proposal a bit later for a, a hose pipe tethered to helium balloons uh, to do that. If we go down to the, uh, the black box engineering approaches, uh, it is being there are several proposals around. Actually, one of them, uh, not the one illustrated here, um, actually has been be developed in, in, uh, here in Canada, uh, Calgary. Um, machines that will actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and uh, turn it into a form where it could be sequestered, perhaps in spent oil and gas wells. Now, we take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at the moment. Uh, we have the technology to do that using A-mines. We do it in submarines. It's hideously expensive at present. Um, but you know, the idea here is that with research, we could find cheaper ways to do it uh, and to put the carbon into a form that it could be sequestered in spoil spent oil and gas wells or perhaps uh, saline aquifers. And then the last uh, one here is the black box engineering to do solar radiation management. And here the idea is that you might put some kind of reflectors into space. Probably not a big mirror like the one in this artist's impression. It would be more likely to be a number of uh, small reflective surfaces. And you could put these possibly at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, or you could have an orbital mechanism uh, that would uh, reflect sunlight back. That's probably the most sort of sci-fi-ish of all of these, and probably going to be pretty darned expensive because of the technical um, equipment you would need to lift that stuff up into space. But these are the kinds of things um, uh, that we're thinking about. Now, why should we worry? What are we worried about already? Well, the first thing that people often come up with is what insurers call a moral hazard. The idea here is that if you provide insurance for a dangerous activity, you encourage people to continue in carrying out that dangerous activity. Uh, and the idea here, the concern here is that if we hold out the prospect of being able to deal with at least some of the climate change issue by geoengineering, that it might lessen the impetus for people uh, to engage in conventional greenhouse gas emissions reduction activities. I would just say in passing here that the same objection uh, was raised for many years against having any discussion of adaptation to climate change. I would say throughout the uh, late 1980s and late 1990s, uh, trying to talk about adaptation uh, in the climate change discourse was a bit like trying to talk to Southern Baptists about sex education in schools. Um, it wasn't something that was to be encouraged because uh, it was seen as encouraging the kids to engage in bad behavior. Another objection is the idea that um, even if we're just doing research, not only does it hold out this prospect of a moral hazard, but it's a slippery slope. And the argument here is that once you actually begin to do research into the topic, uh, that there is a momentum that will kick in that will actually lead eventually to the implementation of the technology. And even if it doesn't lead to the implementation of technology, another variation on this argument is the idea that even if you start to do the research, you're beginning to make what ought to be unthinkable, thinkable. And this is where we get into the whole area of the ethics of the deliberate uh, modification of the climate or terraformation. Obviously, unintended consequences uh, are a concern when we're talking about technologies which at the present moment are really just ideas. Uh, we've got bits of the technologies that we're talking about here, but there are no fully formed uh, examples of these technologies, and we're, we're not really sure uh, what, the, uh, what the implications of implementing them would be. Climate modelers think they've got a pretty good handle, for example, on what sulfate aerosols would do for temperature, uh, but there's a great deal of uh, indeterminacy about what the implications uh, would be for precipitation. Uh, and that's obviously a question of concern because of the huge impacts uh, that you could, you, you could have on global agriculture. 
There's the danger of socio-technical lock-in. The idea here that, we, that if we start to do these things, we will be locked into doing them over and over for at least a very long time. Particularly in the case of those sulfate aerosols I was talking about, uh, to form a kind of umbrella to reflect some of the sun's energy back. Uh, if you put those in place and you rely on those to uh, stabilize the global temperature, but you're still pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and then you find you've got a precipitation problem upsetting global agriculture. So you decide, oh, well, we better switch that off. It'll only take a couple of years for that sulfur to drop out of the, uh, out of the sky, uh, but you're going to have a very sudden temperature spike, and that's potentially very disruptive. So that's an example of technical locking. Now, you may think, what about those carbon dioxide sucking machines? You know, surely all you have to do to turn those off, if they have a negative uh, consequence, is to flick a switch, and presumably they will switch off. But Bear in mind that if you're going to go down that technological route, you're talking about a very large infrastructure investment, and you're going to have created vested interests in keeping that technology running. And that's an example of a socioeconomic uh, form of lock-in rather than technical lock-in. So there are two kinds of lock-in uh, that we have to worry about here. There's the whole issue of public acceptability. We already know that uh, uh, these pro technological proposals are uh, pretty controversial. And if you think about it for a moment, we've just spent most of the last 50 years telling people it's a really bad idea to put stuff in water and, 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 and air, haven't we? You know, uh, we still think of the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act as being major victories uh, for uh, the environment. And now we're actually going to tell people that we want to put sulfur, sulfate aerosol into the atmosphere. We want to put uh, chemicals into the ocean. That might actually be quite a hard sell to persuade people uh, that's a good idea after we spent half a century trying to talk them out of it. The whole issue of costs is a very open one. It's interesting. We, um, you will see very detailed economic cost analyses with pages and pages and pages of economic uh, calculations. Uh, what we found on the Royal Society was that all of those cost estimates are entirely uh, sensitive to the input assumptions. In other words, um, the costs are what you want them to be. If you want these technologies to seem hideously expensive, you will make input assumptions that make them seem hideously expensive. If you want to make them seem relatively cheap compared to other kinds of uh, climate policy measures, you can do that too. So at the moment, that's pretty much an open question. Uh, why do I say dangerously cheap or hideously costly? Uh, one of the th worries about them, if they're dangerously cheap, uh, is that, in fact, they might be implemented by a rogue state uh, or even by a rogue individual, uh, a very wealthy uh, individual. Um, I think some of these concerns are uh, perhaps uh, overstated. Uh, I certainly don't think it's beyond the ability of nation states to close down entrepreneurs uh, who decide to put sulfate aerosols into the air from their Caribbean islands or whatever. Uh, and I don't seriously think that major powers uh, would unilaterally engage uh, in... Uh, sulfate aerosol uh, as, as a method of geoengineering without some kind of an international agreement. Uh, what I think in this case the most likely thing is that you'd find some uh, particularly vulnerable small island states doing it as an act of civil obedience to call to draw attention uh, to the seriousness of their plight. Why hideously costly? Because I've said, uh, you know, actually the aerosol technology um, at least compared to some other things, may look fairly inexpensive to do. It's not rocket science, if you'll forgive me saying so. Um, but if it does have that negative impact on global agriculture, uh, then the overall system cost uh, could be very high. And this is another variable, by the way, in the economic analyses, is how wide you draw uh, the boundaries around your analysis, particularly when you're thinking about impacts. And then, of course, the whole issue of control. What's the role of the, public, of the private sector here? Should there be a private sector role? Um, and what are the issues to do with national and international governance? There's vociferous opposition. We shouldn't understate it. Um, there's uh, two of the uh, NGOs who've been particularly vociferous, uh, uh, et cetera, and Home, Hands Off Mother Earth, both of which are based uh, here in Canada. Uh, and Canada's leading environmentalist, uh, David Suzuki, has described geoengineering as madness. Um, Britain's equivalent, uh, the, uh, the uh, sacred uh, David Attenborough, uh, has described geoengineering as a fascist technology. Uh, so there are clearly those uh, who think that this is uh, just simply uh, an 
something that we shouldn't even be thinking about. Not all of the environmental movement takes that uh, view, obviously, and uh, we'll hear a bit more from Steve Hamburg lately, uh, for example, about EDF's views on this issue. How might we govern it is the, is the question. What is, do I mean by it? I mean here the entire process of thinking about geoengineering, researching it all the way through uh, to potential implementation. And indeed, the Royal Society concluded that the acceptability of geoengineering really is highly dependent uh, on resolving the serious and complex governance issues uh, that it throws up and recommended the development of gov governance frameworks uh, to guide the entire process from research through to possible deployment. One of the things I would point out is that there is an, an interesting paradox uh, in thinking about the, the governance issues here, which is the thing that technically seems to be easiest at this point, which would be sulfate aerosols, actually might be the most difficult to govern. Personally, I do not, and, and I am, by the way, if, for those of you who don't know uh, about my, uh, my other work, uh, I think I'm fairly well known for being deeply skeptical of the necessity of a single global treaty uh, in order to have effective uh, climate policies. Uh, I think most climate policies could be implemented without having a global treaty. Uh, but even I would say that you, I cannot envisage doing solar radiation management without a universal agreement among nations uh, to do it. And we know how good we are at getting those kinds of instruments when it comes to, uh, to climate change. So the technically easiest thing may be actually the most difficult thing to do from a governance point of view. On the other hand, those carbon sucking machines, provided you're not putting your carbon down gas wells that uh, cut across national boundaries or are going into uh, international waters, uh, you could pretty much do those, it seems to me, under existing environmental regulation and existing planning rules. Uh, and so, because there's very little in the way of an obvious uh, trans-border uh, effect there. Uh, on the other hand, those are the, precisely the measures that seem to be technically uh, the, most diff the most distant from being realizable in any kind of realistic way. And I think it's important uh, to bear in mind here the aphorism that hard cases make bad law. If we, divide, if we think that we have to design a governance mechanism uh, for solar radiation management uh, that covers all, all of the, uh, the potential issues there um, before we can start to do any other kinds of climate geoengineering uh, activities, we may actually uh, be tying our hands much more than we, uh, we want to. There are existing attempts at regulation or existing uh, efforts at regulation. Uh, the Lumping, London Dumping Convention has asserted uh, its jurisdiction over putting uh, things into the ocean, particularly uh, iron. Uh, it assigns the uh, responsibility uh, for managing those activities in the research phase to the government uh, of the port of departure of the vessel that is actually doing uh, the experiments. Uh, the Convention on Biodiversity has uh, attempted to intervene here. Uh, initially at the Nagoya meeting, there was a very restrictive pr proposal that would have banned, quote, all geoengineering activity until the science is better known. And immediately, of course, the question crosses your mind, if all geoengineering activity includes things like this uh, meeting here today and any kind of ex scientific experimentation, how would we ever get the science that would ena that enable us to make informed judgments uh, about the technology. Um, so at the moment, the general impression that we have is that governments are keeping a watching brief, but they're not rushing uh, to get involved here. We are really facing what social scientists call the technology control dilemma. This was uh, pointed out first by the British sociologist of science, David Collingridge, in the 1980s. And as he explained, when you have a new emergent technology, where you've got a lot of ignorance, a lot of uncertainty about how it's going to turn out, you would, you would ideally like to set in place the governance arrangements before that technology becomes hardwired. Because to go back afterwards and to try to undo things that you've locked in already is much harder uh, to achieve. Think, for example, about the problems we had with asbestos. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but subsequently, once asbestos had become ubiquitously spread around in all kinds of products, brake shoes, fire, uh, fire doors, etc., um, uh, etc., et uh, 
Um, we then discovered that it was something that we didn't particularly want to have spread in our environment. The costs of actually pulling that asbestos back have been tremendous. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that in the early stages of a technology, your idea of it seldom looks like the way technologies r t turn out in the end. Um, and so that anticipation uh, is impossible. Um, so uh, basically what Colin Rudge said, it was, his wasn't a council of despair, uh, was that what you want to do is value flexibility. In thinking about governance arrangements and thinking about making policy decisions about these kinds of emerging technologies, you want to, where you have a choice, opt for flexibility, reversibility, uh, rather than uh, opt for choices that will lock you in. And he said things, that, kinds of things that lock you in are capital intensiveness, long lead times, very hubristic claims for a technology. What could be more hubristic than the idea that a few tons of sulfur is going to save the planet? Um, you know, so clearly, uh, these kinds of considerations are important in thinking about how we would design a governance uh, mechanism. It would also have to be applicable to a wide range of technologies that's very heterogeneous. I think, I, I hope at least uh, I've got that much across. That the, the technologies here really have very little in common with each other, the range of, of, of things that we're considering. And we'd want something that would apply to the entire process from early uh, R&D through to initial deployment and possibly recognize uh, the distinction between transboundary impacts and things that have not have transboundary impacts. One set of principles that has been proposed uh, uh, by some of us in the room here are the so-called Oxford principles. I'm not going to go through these in any detail. Um, these were also taken up and discussed in the Silomar in uh, March 2010. Uh, and there seems to have been a reasonable amount of consensus that these at least are indicative of the kinds of things that we want to put in place uh, for a governance system uh, uh, about uh, these technologies. And underneath those, you would have technology-specific research protocols um, for specific proposals as they develop. And that would allow the different technologies to develop in different places at different paces as is appropriate. So you would see something like the, uh, the air capture technology could develop differently from, uh, from solar radiation management. Uh, and you could specify uh, your uh, particular uh, research protocols for each of those technologies as they go along. And you can revise them uh, at various critical points in the development of the technologies. And just to give you an example where this is already informally uh, being uh, done to some extent, uh, we talked about the Oxford principles. Cambridge is, Oxford is famous for its social science humanities. Cambridge is probably uh, has the edge over us on the natural sciences. Uh, so I've moved from the Oxford principles to the Cambridge pipe here. Um, <laughs> this is a proposed technology, which is basically a ship um, with a 20-kilometer uh, pipe tethered to a helium balloon about the size of Wembley Stadium, uh, up which you would continuously uh, pump sulfur uh, into the strategy. At the present moment, the people who are wanting to explore this technology have made the proposal for a one-kilometer pipe on a deserted airfield, in uh, former military airfield in Cambridgeshire, up which they will pump water. Um, and... Uh, what they're trying to do here is just to explore some of the engineering challenges involved uh, in, in uh, the technology and principle. And the research councils who are funding this actually put in place uh, a stage gate requirement uh, that was specifically uh, requiring a high level of public consultation. Uh, and indeed, when the project was deemed not to have met the requirements of that, uh, the, uh, the experiment was uh, basically held up. Uh, so we can see that this kind of mechanism uh, actually uh, does seem to be usable. So in closing, just a few reflections, um, just to emphasize that at this stage, we're really dealing with what sociologists of science call technological imaginaries. These are not fully formed technologies. We have bits of kit, but we have certain uh, kinds of ideas about uh, how we will put these together into fully-fledged technologies. And we have, of course, uh, certain kinds of assumptions and ideas about uh, the kind of society which they'd be operating in and what the regulatory framework would be for those, uh, how they would be funded, and so on. But what I do want to emphasize here is that despite what you might see from some of the um, 
uh, NGOs who are fiercely opposed to, uh, to ge climate geoengineering, even cli ge climate geoengineering research. This is not actually Dr. Strangelove. Uh, and social scientists who've been observing uh, this, uh, this process, uh, I think, have been mostly uh, impressed by the extent to which the scientific community has really tried to be proactive in thinking early on in the stages of the technology about what the social and governance uh, implications uh, and the other um, ethical implications of the technology would be. And indeed, this is something which uh, social scientists have been advocating uh, for uh, several decades now. And I think uh, uh, we need to recognize that the scientific community uh, actually is taking that up. In a sense, I'm seeing a nervous scientific, a tentative scientific community here, not one that is madly keen to rush out there and get as much of this stuff up into the sky or build as many of these machines uh, as it can at short notice. I'd also like to say, and this is a personal view, that geoengineering will only be implemented if it's seen to be safe, effective, and affordable. Now, I recognize as a social science, scientist that all, those, all three of those words are weasel words. Okay, what counts as safe, what counts as effective, what counts as affordable. But it seems to me that unless at some level there is some consensus that that's the case, I personally don't believe that any of these technologies are implementable. Um, that's uh, not a view that is uh, necessarily universally held. Um, but I think it does, uh, it is a view that stands in contrast to those who talk about geoengineering as a set of technologies that would be used in a climatic emergency. Uh, and I think that the, uh, uh, the climatic emergency uh, tipping point argument uh, is actually a, a rather worrisome one uh, in this instance. And I think it is hubristic, and I think we should be very cautious about it. But ultimately, the only way to find out more about what the potential of climate geoengineering is, is to do the research. And I think the imperative for us at the moment is to uh, actually set up governance arrangements that allow us to do that research in a responsible and transparent uh, uh, way uh, that is subject to public scrutiny uh, and uh, where we can demonstrate the trustworthiness, uh, not, or by the way, get the trust of the public, but demonstrate the trustworthiness of those people who are engaged in the research uh, such that they are uh, able to find out whether this is a good idea or not. And sometimes people say, oh, Steve, you're a geoengineering advocate. Uh, I want to be very clear, I am not a geoengineering advocate. I am, however, a geoengineering research advocate. I think we need to have a thorough characterization of the technical and the socioeconomic and ethical implications of these technologies uh, before we make decisions about them. And I'll leave it at that. Steve, thank you very much. So uh, now, before you pepper Steve with questions, which I'm sure you have, I want to introduce uh, a distinguished uh, Canadian science journalist, uh, Peter Calamai, a fellow of the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy, who's going to moderate the panel. And actually, if the, dis if, uh, the panel can come up as well, um, after uh, Peter moderates the, the conversation, then there'll be a chance for question and af answers afterwards. So with that, Peter, I will uh, turn it over to you if the panel comes up. arbitrarily determined that we were going to go in the order on the program, which for none of you have to be, you don't know what the order of the program is. <laughs> but uh, I don't have a gosh, it's going to start off with you. Yeah, sure. Um, or even four. Four minutes and four points. Uh, good evening. I'm Rob Bodhi. I run a big bank in the early from the council and then in the last quarter. We hosted the first uh, workshop of its kind in the government of the government in India uh, in September last year. Uh, thanks to the world. 
Steve concluded by arguing that he was a geoengineering research academic. And uh, I, I'll lay my case out on the table right now. I'm a geoengineering governance academic. I think uh, a lot of what Steve argued uh, highlights the, the need to think about what are the current governance arrangements and ensure that the governance catch up that that is already happening. That's not uh, in a situation where there's a wide deficit between the research that's undertaken by the scientists and the government that's undertaken by a range of people. Four points I wanted to make in three and a half minutes. Essentially, um, what is it that we're trying to govern? What do countries want? How do we go about designing something? Um, and, and big question, the big elephant in the room, what does that mean for the time and negotiations of uh, 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 a What do we want to govern? I actually, as Steve also mentioned towards the end, that uh, a, a lot of this is what he called technological imagination. This is not stuff that's already been deployed, this is not stuff that, that is even ready to be deployed. So if we are trying to govern something, got to understand uh, what is the current vision, whether it's on the protocol, the convention, or the policy fertilization, the UNFCC, the United States Program, program. Are they governing research or are they governing uh, an imagination of deployment of the engineering in the future? And some of the work that Jason and I have done of the examining these different lead us to conclude that most of these international organizations and relations that have anything relevant to say about the engineering of solar and really are more towards the end of scale than the deployment, much less towards the future. So we can sense while governance as a whole is playing catch up, uh, the existing governance regimes have put the market forward. So we need to rethink about the kind of conditions that, that are required to govern. That brings us to the second question of what do countries want? And this is something interesting because uh, until summer last year, the conversation I had seen about here in Canada was largely amongst scientists and social scientists in, in, in the West, uh, with, with, a, with a few of us drawing. Since summer last year, we've had in Singapore, in India, in China, and, uh, and we hope that that country is destroyed. But it's hard to obviously summarize what 193 countries and as we would want with regard to government. But let's put it uh, in two big buckets. One is the material issues. Countries are always uncomfortable about losing a technological base, no matter what kind of they want to be involved in what kind of research undertaking, uh, and they want to become any kind of placeholders that are involved. So countries are worried about uh, the lateral action that they have to control over. Countries are also concerned about knowledge science and freedom. That's one bucket, material interest. And the other bucket is about the ethical concern. Who's to decide? Who is to decide not only what is safe, but safe for whom, effective for whom, affordable for whom, who undertakes the cost. So if you're not at the table making those decisions, you have an ethical concern about the process. Uh, similarly, you have an ethical concern about the outcome, the kind of governance structure that you create in terms of how decisions are made, how decisions and then lastly, uh, to conclude on, if we have to design a new government structure for the engineering, we need much wider possibilities. Um, here I would partially disagree with Steve, because you say, it does not matter how benign the intentions are of scientists who want to take a very adequate uh, approach to the science. It does matter how widely they engage with the engineering. If you don't do that, then you're going to end up with that. 
Which leads me to the last point. What does this mean to say climate association? Just to do the turban, we are thinking now about coming up with a new agreement that, that involves every country uh, affected by 2020, but the agreement has been signed by 2015. Remember, in 2014, the IPCC would come out, come out with a fifth assessment report which will assess the science of How does that fit in? I'll leave you with that question maybe later when we discuss it and we can play around with some scenarios. Thanks. Thank you very much. We don't disagree. Sure. Thank Thanks. Um, my name is Bidisha Banerjee. I'm a program director at Dalai Lama Fellows, a startup ethical leadership incubator based in San Francisco. And I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, Jason and Sean and everyone at CG for organizing such a, such a wonderful and important conference. Thank you to Steve for kicking us off um, <coughs> with your talk. Um, as I was sitting in the audience, I was reminded of um, the fact that Roman emperors uh, apparently had a spearman standing behind them at all times, whose only job it was, um, was to remind the emperor of their own mortality at all times. So in that spirit, I'm going to offer four spearmen that anyone working on geoengineering governance should be aware of, should sort of like visualize, or should consider visualizing standing behind them at all times. And those spearmen, its only job would be to remind the the geoengineering advocate, research advocate, um, the geoengineering uh, governance advocate to think about humility, doubt, uncertainty, and interconnectedness. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more into what I mean by those um, by talking about some of the specific points that Steve made. For example, that Steve talked about um, the reason that we should be focusing on geoengineering is to, s to sort of stave off um, the possibility of encountering climate tipping points. Um, scientists, climate scientists that I've spoken with, um, some of them will tell you, we won't actually know when we've crossed a tipping point until well after we've crossed that tipping point. Um, so it seems like even before we can encounter this question of geoengineering governance, we really need to think about what do we already know, what are the uncertainties in climate science that we need to all be much more apprised of. Um, when we talk about moral hazards, um, Steve talked about a slippery slope um, where perhaps research would automatically lead to deployment. Um, that's definitely one moral hazard, but there are certainly other, other ones that are also on the table. For example, the possibility that talking about geoengineering or, or, or researching it or talking about geoengineering governance will increasingly make this seem like it's perhaps more viable than adaptation or mitigation or any of those other options that have been on the table for a long time. Um, in terms of uncertainty, I really agree with what Arunava said. Um, we really need to be much more clear as to who benefits from any particular intervention that we're researching, who is harmed, and how can we know. Um, in, in particular, we need to be really, really conscious that the world's most vulnerable people, those who are most vulnerable to climate change, may also be most vulnerable to the adverse effects of geoengineering. Um, for example, solar radiation mitigation, the, the example that was uh, focused on at some length, um, there are some studies that indicate that it may increase the possibility of drought in parts of Africa and Asia. Um, I, I, I think that those are all the types of um, reasons why we should always, you know, whenever we're, we're considering uh, deliberation on geoengineering governance, that we should have these spearmen, humility, doubt, uncertainty, and interconnectedness, you know, just visualize them standing at our backs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve, are you, are you plugged I've in? already turned plugged it on. Into God? Good, okay, okay, thank you. Go ahead. So I, I, I want to pick up, uh, Rava mentioned the elephant in the room, and uh, Steve's talk made me think of my grandmother, who always uh, put a bet out in front of me when I was young, which was, I dare you to not think about an elephant for a minute, and if you win the bet, I'll give you a dollar. And I never collected the dollar. And I think what's important about there, what's relevant, is the notion that we can't put the genie back in the bottle. People have imagined these issues. They're out there, people are thinking about them, and as they're challenged, we can't stick them back in. You won't win that bet. And, and I think that I start with that premise, that ignorance is our enemy here. 
that without better informing the issues that Steve so well laid out in front of us, we are going to be, the risks are far greater. My personal bet is that as we begin to understand these issues related to both the technology and the governance, the probability that we deploy or use these in any way is going to decline. Because I think that the, and there's a, there's a group of scientists working on it, that as we understand the implications better, the risks will seem so large and so daunting that we won't want to ever contemplate it. And the governance will become stricter. But ignorance is the thing that doesn't allow that to happen. Because we can all speculate, we all compete, and none of us can bring enough evidence to bear in any of it to really effectively uh, have an, a discussion. Um, and one thing I would uh, maybe push a little further on what Steve said is he talked about small island nations maybe doing something. I think that the tipping points are closer at hand. I think there are going to be more nations and more groups of people who are going to be facing the dilemma of the small island nations where some of them are doomed. There's enough climate change now baked in that they will not exist. It's no longer much in doubt. So that we have to recognize that I think there are more actors out there who will get desperate sooner. And that's where the real danger ex exists. Um, and I can't tell you who or when or how, but I, think it, but I think it's real. And all of that then leads to something that I think all of us on the podium agree to, or certainly those who've worked on this issue or the ones that I've worked with, is that an open conversation and discourse a global conversation about governance and about how to look at it is our ally. No matter what our personal views are about what will happen in this technology, that our enemy is a closed system, an open system of conversation is going to um, bring a far better result than a closed one. And that's why EDF as an environmental organization is involved. We in no way are suggesting that we should deploy we're not even close to that. We have the double conditional, is we need to be, if the rechart shows that something might be doable, and if the risks are great enough, and if the downside risks of deployment are small enough, maybe we should consider it, okay? But at the front end, our risks are far greater with if the ignorance is, continues, and if the conversation is not open and global. So we have worked hard in both those realms to try and open up the conversation and at least work in the small ways we can to reduce those two, and I'll end with that. Can I ask to lead off Steve if he wants to respond to anything? I think I agree with everything that everybody's... Uh, it was very boring. <laughs> so far. I, I guess, you know, the, the area where I slightly may diverge from Steve is I think the heterogeneity of the technology is really important here. And whereas I think that for many of them, you're absolutely right, that as we learn more about them, we will become more wary of them. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily closed at this point to the idea that, uh, that, that for some of them, they actually might be able to play some kind of a useful role as part of a, an overall toolkit alongside mitigation and adaptation technology uh, and measures. Uh, uh, that would be useful in the future. R Particularly right. given what seems to me to be the, the fact that we are vastly underestimating the scale of the mitigation problem. And, and I would agree, and one of the things I meant to say that I didn't is that I, I, we, we are focused on solar radiation management, not uh, carbon dioxide removal. And um, so my comments were really within the context of solar radiation management. Um, and if you use the larger uh, sort of panoply of potential, and I would agree with you. Jason, are you going to do the roving mic, or are we just going to ask people we to yell? We have a roving mic here. So please indicate if you have a question so that the roving mic can come to you and then everyone can hear you. And back, please. You can be my spotters back there, OK, because I missed somebody. It's on? Uh, so given the difficulty of predicting what the unintended consequences will be of uh, geoengineering and also the unforeseen consequences of continuing without geoengineering. How, uh, how do you foresee visualizing 
the uh, or quantifying the risks and weighing the risks when we can really only use hindsight uh, with such complex systems? Well, I mean, that's why I think that you have to have an overarching set of principles which are, in fact, not based on technologies but are based on society and the things that society values and wor is worried about. And then you have your specific research protocols for each stage of research in which you say for the next stage of research these are the things that we need to, to be taking care of with reference to those principles. And at each stage you have to refer back and make sure that before you take the next stage in the research process as you go from computer simulations to lab experiments outside the lab experiments to limited field trials to some kind of field trial at some kind of scale that at each stage you ensure um, that you have uh, taken care of uh, the things that you're concerned about. And, of course, I think taking into account very much the, um, the Colling Ridge dilemma kinds of question, which is, is what we're doing reversible? Um, is it, you know, do we have the flexibility and so on? You don't want to commit yourself to irreversibilities. Um, so I think it has to be a stage-by-stage a -stage careful set of steps. I don't think you can look at, project out into the long-term future for a whole suite of technologies uh, and, uh, and come up with an answer. I mean, it's, it's something that we're going to have to, to, to work through. And has humanity ever done anything like that before? Well, I think it's arguable. Um, I, I think... Uh, it's hard to find, a, uh, off the top of my head, cases where uh, you can say that has been done with forethought. But you might also make the argument that, of course, every successful technological deployment and, 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 and uh, uh, innovation that humanity has, uh, uh, has taken care of, uh, has developed, has some of that characteristic to it. That basically we do actually muddle through. We don't have grand designs that. Grand designs tend to, like um, large liners, uh, end up on the rocks and get too close to shore. Yeah. Capsize. Well, um, in, in terms of, of understanding the impacts or the potential adverse impacts, I think we do have examples where, as we started to explore model, not even without with doing field experiments, um, that we've realized that the downside risks are so large that we pull back from things. And I'm, I, I'll just anecdotally mention, I have a, a good friend who was teaching civil engineering um, in the 60s. Uh, and he was a large you know, dam builder, canal worked on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, and they used to talk about using nuclear devices. This isn't for war or anything. This was simply to do what was believed to be socially beneficial in the pursuit of that. Well, of course, as people modeled that more and understood it, they realized it was ludicrous. And of course, it was wiped from the textbooks, and we would never consider doing that. But it was the additional thought modeling it out rather than someone trying to go off and do it because they had a problem. So that was a case where we recognized through more thought, through more effort, more research, that this was a terrible idea. And the downside risks were so much greater than the upside benefits that there was no way we should engage in it. And as far as I know, no one ever actually used nuclear devices in, for civil uh, civil construction purposes. And if I can just that, you know, there, there is a, a emerging body of literature as to how we can move beyond cost-benefit analysis when doing risk analysis for um, issues like this. Um, particularly environmental assurance bonds um, is one idea that's been thrown around. It's, it's a very nation idea. There's a possibility that it would actually discourage any research, which is perhaps not what we want. Um, but you know, it's, it's this idea that the, the people doing the research or the deployment would be held liable for you know, the sort of worst case amount of damages that they could cause. So I think there's a lot of like, room for innovation um, in response to your excellent question. Using nuclear bombs to dig kind of passageways did make the cover of Popular Science magazine. However, I remember it very well. You have a question. Uh, yes, it's here. Okay. Is it on? I'll talk loudly. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent um, carbon capture and storage technologies are considered in any way um, sort of a small scale precursor to some of these geoengineering technologies. 
And if so, would uh, they offer some a case study of sorts regarding potential consequences or barriers, a social, technical, or economic barriers? Um, well, I think I'm, as a natural scientist on the group, I've got that one. Um, so that's one of the reasons. So one of the things that we might differ on the, on the panel here is, is to what degree uh, solar radiation management, carbon dioxide removal pose the same questions and need to be joined or not joined. And so clearly for carbon dioxide removal, because they're actually very closely aligned sets of technical issues. Um, because at least one of the solution, uh, ways of dealing with carbon dioxide removal is, as Steve described, of putting it down it, it, it below ground in some kind of storage uh, system, which is just like uh, CCS would uh, involve if you did it with a power plant, or at least most of the current tests are. Um, so technologically, those are, very, those are sisters. I mean, they are married at the hip. Um, and so those are, there's a suite of issues there uh, that, that cross a whole lot of, uh, of um, technologies. I'm less concerned about that because there are ways of doing tests that I think, uh, I personally as a scientist, don't bother me. I mean, as long as they're done well, proper controls, small enough, without having large scale. We know that there are earthquakes that can be precipitated. We know geologists know if you do it right, the right governance, where you need to avoid it and learn how to do it. And there is a research community that's been working on that, though for a whole host of reasons, there's much less of that today than there was two years ago. Hello, can you hear? Yeah, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Rainer for your uh, talk. It was very thoughtful and, and clear. Uh, later on, uh, when the question of governance came, then I think that uh, I do not have a question, but maybe more of a clarification. How do you respond to the tension between geo strategic research, geoengineering research, tension between geoengineering research and governance. Uh, I ask for this clarification because here in Canada for a long time we thought that we were in Kyoto, that we were going to support that agreement and we were going to follow it. And so sometimes we were in, sometimes we were out, but now finally we are not fo going to follow it. Uh, similar pro problems we see in the states, like the politicians like, do not even seem to, to agree that there is a problem called global warming. Someone uh, said not too long ago, actually a senator, that global warming is a big hoax. It's not real. Now, those things point to the, the problem in governance, because if the politicians and governments do not even realize or maybe admit that there is this serious problem, then they are not going to fund the research, they are not going to support the scientists, and not only in geoengineering, but in other fields as well. So how can this tension between scientific research and governance can be, can be resolved? Just, just your reflections and, and that, that would do. Thanks. Well, I, I think you're raising a much larger pro, uh, set of issues there about the whole uh, question of climate uh, approaches to climate policy. Um, my, own, my own view has always been um, that uh, Kyoto was a poorly designed uh, way of trying to go about dealing with the challenges of, of climate change uh, for a whole number of reasons that I don't have time to go into here. But it was based on flawed analogies with, uh, for example, uh, stratospheric ozone regime, um, uh, sulfur emissions in the United States and sulfur trading uh, and uh, believe it or not the strategic arms reduction uh, treaty which is where the idea of mutually stage reductions uh, uh, come from and so on. Um, so I, th I think uh, 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 that uh, we are going to enter into an era in which we're going to see a much more differentiated set of or much, or, uh, we're going to move away from the idea of a single big treaty framework that's going to uh, 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 govern how the world deals with this issue to something that is going to be much more uh, uh, fragmented and piecemeal with different countries and different blocks doing different things. Uh, and I think that uh, geoengineering uh, will be part of that differentiation of, of, uh, uh, of activities. And you'll see more enthusiasm for it in some places than in others. <laughs> 
about governance, you've got, to, uh, you've got to think along two axes. One is governing what? So if you take geoengineering, or even if you take geoengineering research, <coughs> that axis will tell you, are you permit, uh, is your governance framework permitting that research? Is it regulating that research? Is it completely prohibiting that research? And the other axis is going to ask the question, how are you going to make that decision? How are you going to monitor that decision? And then how are you going to enforce or, uh, uh, or resolve any disputes? Right? Now, how does this fit into the question you raised? If you come from a country where, say, the majority are arguing that there is no global warming, and the negotiator goes to the larger global kind of climate negotiations, says, well, we refuse to negotiate on this because we don't believe there is any global warming. It's, if that's the remit, then you're not going to be governing geoengineering either, because it does not flow. But if you come from a country where you think it is global warming is a problem or climate change is a problem, and then you're trying to think about the different elements and different strategies by which you would respond to it, then geoengineering is just one of many different avenues. This is why the question of what happens with uh, the new round of negotiations becomes important. When IPCC AR5, when IPCC AR5 comes out with its report in 2014 and gives an assessment of the geoengineering science, and UNFCCC also does an assessment of how effective we've been in mitigating the uh, climate change, He's number six. then okay. we are forced into that matrix, like it or not. So then the big question is, who is going to be sitting at that table to make that decision? But if your starting point is that I don't believe in this problem at all, then you shouldn't be sitting at that table at all either. Okay. Yes, um, I'm just wondering if in fact, you've just made, uh, made the point that, uh, that I think is near and dear to my heart, and that is that if you think geoengineering is a challenge, I'd venture to suggest that the attitudinal and behavioral change required of institutions and governments is, uh, is much more of a challenge. And so I'd be curious to know what your current thinking is, seeing as how this is a conference about governance, uh, what your thinking is about how we move beyond uh, simply sharing of information and sharing of research among 190 countries around the globe to really talking seriously about the potential of any kind of regime that's going to be an enforcement and compliance regime. I don't see any issue uh, on the table right now where that's being taken seriously in a governance sense. I'll defer to our lawyer. <laughs> oh, you deal with the law, excuse me. But, uh, no, that's, that, that's an excellent question. It goes back to the, the, the first point I made, which is that a lot of the regimes, to the extent that they have any relevance uh, in their mandates to geoengineering, uh, are on the deployment side. And they're not looking at, at research. But, uh, so let's take the CBD, for example, which the Convention on Biological Diversity, which uh, in Nagoa, in, October 2010, um, adv <coughs> advised that, government, uh, that, that, that uh, there should be a moratorium on large-scale kind of uh, field testing or deployment of geoengineering technology. But it's an advice. It's, it does not have any legal force. Now, let's take UNFCCC or Kyoto, uh, which was meant to have more legal force than the other Rio conventions. And you can see that countries can you know, withdraw from it without facing the penalty of, of having not met their commitments. So in international relations, at the end of the day, there is no way to, to guarantee that, you will, that some law will be enforced. But in the minimum, the broader the conversation gets, and the more countries that are at the table, uh, you increase the probability that at least the naming and the shaming will prohibit countries or preclude countries from completely do going down a unilateral route. Uh, that is governance at the international level. We should not uh, discount national level governance either. Uh, and as I think as Steve mentioned, 
uh, it's very well within the rights and capabilities of states to regulate their own scientific bodies and, and communities, or if, if you want to go to an extreme, rogue actors who have very uh, 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 narrow vested interests. Currently, I have six people on the speakers list, so I'm not going to recognize anybody for a few minutes until we work down the speakers list a bit. This is on? Yes. Uh, I wish. I say six people on the questioners <coughs> list, so we don't encourage speech. Sir, right. go ahead. Yes, <laughs> I just want to say, I wish it would people might have introduced themselves when they were asking the questions. I would have found it helpful personally. Uh, but my name is Pat Mooney from the Etc. Group. And I have two very quick questions for anyone on the panel who would like to respond. Uh, the first is, it, there seems to be an emphasis always in the geoengineering discussions that there's something called sound science that can be applied here and that governments will respond to that sound science and behave in a, a logical and equitable way at, in addressing geoengineering. I wonder if anyone on the panel can identify examples of sound science which governments have collectively addressed well in recent times. Uh, I think they're rather rare. And the second question is, in, in the, uh, there's an assumption as well that somehow when governments get together or a handful of governments get together to deal with, the, with geoengineering, that they will equitably and, and, and honestly address the concerns of marginalized peoples around the world as they address the question. And I wonder again if anyone on the panel can identify times in recent history, in let's say the last century, where faced with crises, whether they're military or environmental or, 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 or financial, uh, where, where those governments with power have behaved equitably and honorably towards marginalized peoples around the world, and we can trust them then to take on geoengineering for the planet as well. Thank you. Well, I, I'd be willing to take on the first question then and defer that the second one to my colleagues. <laughs> so, um, and I'm not exactly sure what, what, what you mean by sound science. So, I mean, we do have peer review, uh, review processes in most of the certainly developed countries uh, and, 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 and many others in which there is a fairly uh, involved process of weeding out uh, ideas and proposals. Uh, what, what, I think the question was, in what instances have you seen governments actually take ac actions on what was agreed to be sound science? Well, concerned, I, 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 I mean, I, th that, I think... I think, I, think, I think this also speaks to a larger, larger question, which is what is the role of science in public policy and there is often, I'm afraid, a bit of a conceit on the part of scientists that if you get the science right and you make the politicians un or the decision makers understand the science, they will do what the science tells them, as if somehow or other the political imperative were d derivable entirely from the science. Uh, and, I mean, we have time and again instances uh, where uh, politicians make different decisions and in fact, they ought to be making different decisions because it's not just the science that is relevant to the decision-making process. It's also uh, questions of public acceptability. There are ethical issues. There are economic issues. Uh, you know, there are broader social issues that also need to be taken into account in making those decisions. So the fact that you don't that, that it's difficult to point to instances where you can say the science spoke unambiguously and drove the decision that was made. And in fact, I would argue that, that, that in a sense, this very conceit lies at the root of the, re, of, of the problem that we've been having for a very long time now, which is that we have been having surrogate arguments about science instead of proper arguments about policy. And that's why, in fact, that, that we've seen climate science held to a platinum standard of reliability uh, that no that, that governments and private sector decision makers never expect in the realms of defense or economics or anything else. Why did that happen? In part because when certain scientists went before Congress in the very early stages of the 1980s, called attention to climate change, they said to the politicians in Congress, here's the problem, this is what you have to do if you buy my diagnosis. And decision makers very naturally said, well, I'm not actually sure that I want to buy a diagnosis. The only option that you've left me now is to contest your science. So we had actually scientists being poor politicians and the politicians returning the compliment. Uh, and I think we've got to be much more nuanced and careful about thinking about the relationship between science and policy. It's not just a question of science speaks and drives or ought to be driving decision making. So I, I agree with Steve, but I do think there are very, very good examples. We're sitting in a place that there was a, 
a big debate between Canada and the United States about the role of uh, uh, atmospheric acids and their well, impact. Well, I'm not saying science is irrelevant, by the way. Well, you know you weren't. <laughs> uh, in, a, in a case where the science was evolved over a period of time and direct policy action was taken to reduce the quantity of those acids with the predicted impacts that have been measured in the environment. So that's a, a very clear case. Um, and I think there are many others like that. Uh, I would concur with Steve that it's also a question of ensuring that scientists understand the distinction uh, between their role and that of policy making and sometimes that gets blurred and, and confuses the argument and so we, we have surrogate arguments about science when they should be about policy. But I think there are many examples where the science has uh, been done, we understand the problem better and it's led to, to change in policy. Uh, sulfur reduction would be a great prime example. And in this case, that you want to tackle the second question about the big powerful nations of the world have stood up for the little guy and the marginalized people of the world in, in decisions? Please. I think it also, your question also gets to the previous question about, you know, the, how do we bring about the attitudinal kind of changing of hearts and minds that's, that's necessary in order to um, have compliance uh, and enforcement. And I guess I would turn to the moral philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah in this case. Um, he, uh, his, his newest work actually looks at honor, which is a word that you mentioned as well. Um, and it looks at how kind of revolutions in terms of what is considered honorable uh, have led to things like the civil rights movement, the end of foot binding in China, et cetera. Um, and I think that we can learn a lot from um, the way that vanguards in the past, so say small groups of say like educated elites, might have adopted practices and agreed to comply to practices that seemed really unthinkable at the time, but eventually precipitated kind of a shift in the honor code. So for example, we're starting to see businesses come forward right now that um, are accepting compliance, you know, that are accepting that there can be a new way of doing business um, that, that, that puts some of these um, standards that we need to see um, in action. Next question. Hello. Uh, is this uh, functioning? I'm David Lee. I'm from the Canadian International Council Ottawa branch. Uh, and I must say, uh, Dr. Rayner, your uh, presentation was magisterial. I'm wondering if there's any way that it could be put on a website or that I think many of us would be would find it very helpful to be able to make use of it. That I see the <laughs> nodding taking place, so that's encouraging. Um, my uh, question or, or comment or something is is um, uh, is twofold. You suggested that the uh, that uh, at a number of points that there should be agreement uh, on this, that, or the other thing. I think all the points were were well taken on which they, there should be agreement. Um, there was also a suggestion, however, that this agreement might be just among smaller groups. Um, I, I wonder whether the, you and the panel think that these issues are of sufficiently small importance that only a few countries agreeing on them would be adequate. Uh, my own view is that, uh, particularly if we take account of the, of the most uh, vulnerable, uh, that it is sufficiently important that these be uh, very widespread agreements um, binding or uh, to be implemented uh, around the world. Um, this brings me to um, a second point. Uh, mention was made of a number of different agreements uh, and suggestion was that they had not been uh, adequate to deal with this kind of problem. Um, one of my, in my, in a distant past, I was involved in international <coughs> multilateral trade negotiations. Um, they uh, sometimes get a bad rap, but one of the things that they did tackle was measures for the least developed, uh, for the most vulnerable. Um, and in fact, and you can argue with the measures, but there were a whole series of measures put in place to deal with the issues raised by the least developed and argued by them as important to them. Uh, multilateral trade negotiations also arrived at measures for sanctions. Um, again, you can argue about implementation. Uh, 
but this was all provided for in the negotiations uh, in a universally uh, bought into uh, system of, uh, of trade regimes and rules. Um, I wonder if it would be worthwhile for the negotiators in this area uh, to have a look at what they might learn from, uh, positively and negatively, from those negotiations. Thank you. So, anybody want to say how GATT will apply then? I, I don't want to do well, that. I'll let, I'll let someone else do that. But I, but I do want to sort of raise an issue that's of concern to me. When talking about uh, most, the most vulnerable populations or groups among, among us on a, uh, is that it's not a straightforward issue because we can identify communities right now for which only geoengineering has any hope of saving them. There's enough sea level rise baked in, even if we did the most aggressive mitigation anyone can imagine, their history, their toast, they will not survive in their current uh, geography. I mean, they can move. We have, in, the, in small island nations, we have similar peoples in the Arctic where there's enough change going on that they will not already be able to preserve their way of life. So, and then we can, of course, imagine it's not hard to think about doing some geoengineering, and there'll be a lot of other people made vulnerable through doing that. So I think we can't think about that as sort of one group of vulnerable people, but we already have a spectrum of people with differential effects, and that's what makes it so difficult. And we have to be very careful about thinking about sort of a group of vulnerable people. There are many groups with very many different positions which will be affected by this issue because we have only one climate, and whatever we do, it differentially affects people across that climate. Let's up lead, table the WTO for a minute and see if we can get a few more questions in, sir. Thanks very much. My, my name's Andy Sterling. Um, advocating research sounds neutral and, and self-evidently uh, reasonable, but I wonder, especially given Steve's very eloquent advocacy of it, what, what do we do about the hard reality that knowledge itself is political? And that, by that, I mean, it goes beyond moral hazard, because even under moral hazard arguments, we still tend to treat information coming in in a neutral, disinterested way, and then informing policy. And this goes beyond that. It's, it's about how the deep substance and structure of knowledge itself conditions our actions in political ways. So for instance, you know, we thought of the world as clockwork at one time. That had implications for action. The steam engine was formative. Uh, we think of the world now as networks, genetic determinism, all these very deep features of our knowledge have an impact on the way we act. So all these things you know, shape, the, shape, shape things in just the way that we could shape things with thinking about the world in the way geoengineering research would condition us to do. Uh, it's not a bad thing, necessarily, but it's political. And at the moment, I don't hear these debates speaking of knowledge itself as being political in the way that we need to if we're going to be mature about it. Okay. Knowledge is political. Okay. Then we've heard that knowledge is political. Anybody else want to expand upon that? Um, I agree with that, and I guess that I thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I just want to say that you know that's why I think the four spearmen that I've recommended that we all kind of envision whenever we're trying to make any sort of um, decision or conversation about geoengineering governance: humility, doubt, uncertainty, and interconnectedness. You know, I think we should kind of t come back to that vision. Go ahead. Yes. Mark? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mark Sano. I'm with the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy in, in Ottawa. Uh, my question has to do with governance innovation. I just wonder if we need a bit more innovation, because I believe we know that the different nations will have a different, uh, what we could call risk appetite. That's actually a term used in risk management. We know in advance that because of the balance between the risk of doing something versus the risk of doing nothing, there will be great differences between the nations. So can we just go in into a negotiation, an international debate without uh, further governance innovation, further rules on how decisions will be made and thought about this in advance, and just go in there, learn that there will be huge differences in preferences, and then leave it perhaps to the, the game of power to, to come to some kind of progress. I, mean, I think what the last two points uh, raise really important issues. And I have to say, 
but then not in any sense unique to geoengineering. These, I mean, you know, the, the political nature of knowledge and you know, the, the problem of uh, uh, different constituencies in society, even within nation states, let alone different nation states, um, you know, having different risk preferences and so on. These are much broader problems, um, which, uh, yeah, we can, we can try to address some of them more or less well or badly uh, within the framework of talking about geoengineering. But they're also really what um, Horst Rittel, Berkeley, California planner, called in the uh, 1970s, wicked problems. These are not issues for which we will ever find definitive solutions. They are, they are rather challenges of the human condition, which we will negotiate more or less well uh, as, as we muddle our way through life. Uh, and, you know, I, th I think we just have, we, ha we have to recognize that, uh, uh, that, that that's the case. And certainly, I, I, I just cannot envisage how we could use the geoengineering issue as a way to definitively resolve the problems of the political, inherently political nature of knowledge, uh, or the fact that we are always dealing with negotiations among parties with different, uh, uh, different preferences. Uh, and, and indeed, I would even challenge the model of uh, the notion of uh, uh, parties coming to the table with well-formed preferences and negotiating the differences. I think very often, actually, uh, the, uh, the, difference, the things that divide human beings when they enter into discourses often are actually products of the discourse themselves. Uh, and we actually form our, in a sense, form our preferences in the process of negotiation. They're not necessarily pre-given. And that makes it even more complicated. Um, so I think, yes, these are important. They're not trivial issues. Uh, but I think uh, for us to think that we can resolve them in any definitive way in, in relation to any set of issues is, 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 is um, wildly optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think certainly within the discourse about uh, climate geoengineering is not a place we will ever achieve that. Um, I just wanted to thank you for highlighting the need for governance innovation. I definitely think that this is a very important point to, for all of us to hear. Um, and I think CG and Jason have done really interesting work in terms of scenario planning and also thinking about games and other, uh, other sorts of new ways that policymakers can interact with each other in, in, in efforts to think about how to go about governance innovation. Yeah. Time for about three more questions. I hope they're short. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, hi. Um, my name's Pegatha Taylor. I'm a member of, of uh, the Canadian International Council. M my question was, um, it sort of relates a little bit to model. Um, in terms of the existing scientific research, <clears throat> there's sometimes a tendency with, with experimentation for the results of one s set of research to have unexpected influences on research in a, in a different field. Um, I'm just wondering, do you already see any potential for connections between the results that come out of mitigation science, scientific research, and geoengineering scientific research um, in either direction? Um, the thing that sparked me to think about this was your example of plankton. Um, and in the case of research into alternative energies, there's a certain amount of research, I think, that's going on in the area of, of um, plankton also. And I just wondered if you view particular, or you know already of concrete examples where you think it's a hypothetical, but where there might be a certain amount of, of mutual influence. So I'll, I'll, I'll let the scientists talk. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I mean, almost all of what we know about geoengineering comes from that complementarity. So working on sulfur aerosols is an inherent part so, uh, of of just trying to understand the climate system related to making predictions and making sure that we understand the drivers. So the, the issues of volcanic influence, that's not being done for geoengineering. That work's all being done for basic climate science. And that's one, one of the reasons why governance of, of geoengineering is so complicated and important is because you can't easily differentiate. There's no dividing line. Oh, now all of a sudden I'm working on geoengineering. A lot of the basic research is just totally interdigitated. Um, and so it becomes very difficult. There's going to be a flow back and forth. And so, so that's what one of the challenges. You don't even know it 
you know, it's our American Supreme Court, right? You'll know it when you see it, I'm referring to pornography. Well, the problem is you won't necessarily know it when you see it with geoengineering until you've gone a, a certain distance into it. Um, and that's why you have to set up the norms and the, the governance structures to begin to get people to be conscious of that. So the, absolutely, there's a lot of interplay between those. There's a lot of information that as we would begin to uh, do maybe experiments, which are not currently occurring, there, is, there are no experiments with the exception of one in Russia, um, that would very well inform uh, basic climate science, which could help uh, with just understanding what our, both the future look like or mitigation options. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, I see a lot of overlap in the field of research into short-lived climate forces. Next question. Yes. Um, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Linda Perebsky. I'm actually the um, focal point for Canada for the London Protocol. Uh, so we're potentially looking at the governance or the regulation of marine geoengineering. So currently there is, that, there is a, um, uh, a resolution which is non-binding in place that says ocean fertilization isn't allowed except for legitimate scientific research. And on the legitimate scientific research, we require a scientific assessment framework that asks sort of the two questions. Is this legitimate scientific research? Can you actually, do you, can you actually prove or advance knowledge with this? And the second part being, uh, what are the risks to the marine environment of doing this research? And we're looking at potentially making this into binding uh, regulation with also the potential to be able to expand that, that permit issuing or that, that regulatory control onto uh, other uh, marine geoengineering activities. So I guess my, my question for the panel here is that as Canada looks at its participation in this and the degree to which we should enter into this um, sort of regulatory governance framework, if we were setting rules, what kind of advice can you give me for like, what would be your number one rule, I suppose, that we would put in place? Um, or what would be the, the most important element that we would want to see in a, in a regulatory mechanism that is designed to enable the research, potentially prohibit the other activities until there is enough information to know uh, whether they should be able to proceed or not? Your first rule. You can't, you can't have the one first do no harm has already been taken by the doctors. I'd, I'd go back to the Oxford principles that uh, Steve highlighted. I mean, uh, 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 transparency will have to be the very first rule, even before do no harm. I mean, um, uh, the, the problem with the London Protocol is that, you know, the, the li it has limited applicability. So if you, I, I think if you think back of the, uh, to the Indian, Indo-German experiment that Steve referred to, I think, three years ago now, uh, uh, there, there was a lot of concern about you know, whether this has multilateral approval, et cetera. I think if we, if we let, let's think about governance not in terms of what the mandate currently says, but how would we want it to be, right, mm -hmm. ideally. And if, if we are thinking of it that way, then we have to think about internationally coordinated scientific research. And if you have a group of countries, whether it's 20 countries, 192 countries, participating in an internationally coordinated scientific uh, program, which follows each of those steps uh, that have been laid down in terms of principles, then I think the, the, the instrumentality of different conventions and protocols and regimes becomes clearer. If you don't uh, have that prior step, of, of bringing all the parties together, uh, how they contribute. Everybody does not have to throw billions of dollars into the research. Contributions could be in kind. There are multiple examples, the way CERN has mm -hmm. run, the way the mm -hmm. ITER experiment has, been, has come up, the way the Green Revolution came about. I mean, going back to that earlier question about when have the rich stood up for the poor, I think the question is, you know, when have the rich and the poor worked together on scientific problems together? Uh, we need to reflect back on the, the governance standards for each of those examples, and then, then apply it to geoengineering research. Yes, um, uh, I'm Jim McNeil, and I have a, um, a comment and a question. Is this thing working? Okay. 
talk into it. Huh. Uh, about a year ago. Yep. Yeah, just talk into it. We can talk into it. About a year ago. Oh, good. <laughs> about a year ago, um, a CG sponsored a, uh, uh, a session on geoengineering uh, in Waterloo. And those of us privileged to be there heard uh, Jason Blackstock and uh, his colleagues uh, speak for about two hours, I believe, a uh, series of lectures on geoengineering technology. And I must say, it was uh, one of the most frightening two hours that I have ever spent. Uh, partly because the technologies, uh, or at least some of them, uh, seem to be uh, uh, potentially so cheap and so easily deployed. Um, well, with that backdrop, uh, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, and it is that um, uh, the most encouraging thing I heard tonight in uh, our brilliant opening uh, lecture uh, was the um, proposed uh, principles for guidance, which I think came out of Oxford, if, if I remember. Uh, I jotted a couple of them down. Uh, uh, make uh, geoengineering a public good, uh, transparency, public participation, and most importantly, uh, I think governance uh, control in advance of deployment. Well, I must say that if those principles were actually put in force in some way, I think the resulting debates and controversy would make the recent Keystone Pipeline events uh, look like a Sunday school picnic. Um, and that I find encouraging. But what I would like to ask is, um, where do these uh, proposed principles stand? Do they have any status beyond being proposed by Oxford at the moment? And more importantly, uh, who or what bodies, uh, scientific or governmental or intergovernmental, what bodies would have to uh, adopt them in some way uh, before they became effectively operational? OK. Uh, the, the, the principles were actually formulated uh, in Oxford by a group that included some colleagues who are uh, from University College London and the University of Cardiff, as well as Ox Oxford University, uh, in response to an invitation from the UK House of Commons Science and Technology Committee, uh, which invited evidence uh, for a report that it was preparing on the challenges of geoengineering governance. Um, and we, we, we formulated the principles, submitted them to uh, the Science and Technology Committee, and we were very gratified, uh, a little bit surprised, I must admit, uh, but uh, gratified uh, that the committee, with some elaboration, broadly uh, adopted them and endorsed them. Uh, that report then went to the UK government and the government and its report, its, its response to the Science and Technology Committee report also uh, essentially endorsed uh, those principles with some elaborations and qualifications. So they are actually UK government policy, although there are certainly very large swathes of the UK government that doesn't recognize that it has a policy. Um, uh, beyond the UK, uh, they, the, the principles were also presented uh, to the Asilomar Conference on Geoengineering, which took place in March 2010. Um, and at that meeting also, although they were not formally uh, adopted, to quote The Economist, they received widespread acceptance. Uh, and uh, the final report of the conference uh, contained a set uh, of uh, principles that were essentially elaborations on uh, the same principles, and so uh, they were endorsed by a substantial segment of the, uh, the research community. Uh, I should say that the Asilomar Conference was not um, representative of, uh, it was weak on the representation, for example, of developing uh, countries, uh, and much stronger in terms of representation of the US and, uh, and Western Europe. Um, that wasn't actually for want of trying to get some people, but at that stage of, develop, of the development <coughs> of the issue, frankly, there wasn't, a lot of, there, there wasn't a lot of awareness of and therefore interest in uh, 
the issue in the, in the less industrialized world, I think that's changing. Um, but that's where the principles stand at the moment. Um, they appear to have some traction. Uh, I'm glad that you find them uh, encouraging. Uh, the, the authors of them have no uh, pretense or uh, delusion that they are either complete um, or fully, uh, 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 fully developed. Uh, but I think they're a reasonable starting point. Uh, so, and to use your own term from earlier in our, in our long history of muddling through for such things, what would be a, a good next step with respect to those principles? Well, I think, um, you know, obviously uh, an important next step is implementation. Uh, and that's why I'm also in, uh, encouraged by the little example that I gave in the UK where there has been some informal uh, implementation of this model of the principles plus the research protocols. Uh, and in the UK, it's been taken up by the research councils, which are the equivalent of the Nas US National Science Foundation. Um, and you, of course, in Canada have uh, research councils as well. Uh, we, we, we have uh, several which are actually in, independent of each other um, uh, which have come together in terms of funding this particular experiment that I showed you, the so-called Cambridge Pipe. It's actually technically called the SPICE project, uh, S-P-I-C-E. Uh, you can Google it and, uh, and find it. Um, but the, the very fact that uh, they, the research councils themselves took on part of this architecture uh, in determining whether or not to approve that experiment uh, for the SPICE pro project is also, I think, encouraging insofar as it is at least a limited, as I say, rather informal implementation, but it does demonstrate, I think, in principle, uh, that these can be useful. So I guess I would say that, you know, what I would like to see is I would like to see um, uh, the principles discussed as to whether they are, uh, they require further elaboration beyond the Asilomar elaborations. Uh, and um, uh, to think about ways in which in different national contexts uh, they could actually be implemented alongside with these research protocols. I think part of the, the approach that we had here was that the architecture should be flexible so that it fits with the uh, scientific governance regimes of different countries uh, rather than a one-size-fits-all uh, that would make it very difficult, I think, for some countries to, uh, uh, to, to take them seriously. So if I just add one thing that, uh, uh, and similarly, there was a report that Jane Long, who's sitting in uh, the audience, uh, co-chaired in the US to do the same thing. Uh, it was initially requested by the House of Representatives, chair of the Science Committee, and the Bipartisan Policy Center put a similar document together for the US, looking at it with based on essentially the same principles, uh, uh, doing that. And then I'd just add, uh, and Steve mentioned the Asilomar, is that that was, significantly the largest meeting of its kind so far that I'm aware of. So there were 190 scientists representing a very diverse set of backgrounds. And there was, uh, as far as, and we use the term both humility and uh, unanimity in terms of endorsing this in the sense that nobody, there was an opportunity to push back. The science openly spoke about the humility with which they have to face these issues and um, were completely in agreement that the Oxford principles were the right direction and the right approach. That's not to say, again, that the wordsmithing, they, mm -hmm. there was a further elaboration and that will continue. So I think the scientific community has approached this um, very much in the spirit that started in England and has been reaching out in, in the conversations in India and China. I mean, that's, many of us uh, on, on the podium have been working actively to continue to grow this conversation for exactly that reason. Jane's just uh, the person who... Uh, just hold on one second, please. I want to give my two other panelists a chance to, to respond. Did they have anything they wanted to add? No, j j just to add, I think the other thing we should recognize is in, uh, in June 2011, when the IPCC uh, convened the first, uh, f first conference of its kind to, to discuss geoengineering. It's not the first time that the IPCC has referred to geoengineering, but the first time it's been uh, uh, it's been considered in, in a structured fashion. Uh, I was encouraged to, to find that it wasn't just a collection of, of natural scientists who had been called to that meeting, uh, but social scientists as well, to kind of reflect on, at least on some of the governance concerns, although it's not within the IPCC's mandate to kind of prescribe what governance 
arrangements should evolve. And, 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 and to build on what I started out by saying, we've, we've started these conversations in countries of the South. Uh, we've uh, made representations to the principal scientific advisors of the Prime Minister in India. And last month, we submitted a report to the National Security Advisor in India on a report on global governance, which we call Understanding Complexity and Anticipating Change, in which we again refer to geoengineering as one of those issues where we need to start the conversation about putting those governance structures in place, not just internationally, but nationally as well. Okay. Uh, just very quickly, uh, thanks Steve for bringing up the report and the, the idea that we uh, followed the Oxford principles, we elaborated on them, but uh, also I just want to make the point that we did make some preliminary recommendations for institutional uh, mechanisms for implementing them. And I, uh, we, in particular, we recommended a commission be formed in the government to, uh, to, to look to the governance uh, problems and to, to make sure that those principles were being uh, followed in research that was being done in the government. More later, if you're interested. Thanks. Did you want to say anything finally? Uh, Mr. Rabbit? No, I'm good. Thank Jason, you. Jason, it's yours. Okay. Um, it's it's normally a good sign that you've hit on the right topic for conversation when you have way more questions than you have time for here. So I, I want to just take a, a quick opportunity to thank the audience for all of the help in getting this conference going and raising the sort of questions and issues that we're going to be debating and discussing over the next uh, couple of days here and continuing to promote conversation about, to get more people involved in the dialogue. Um, so stay tuned for the book that's going to come from this. It's going to be published by EarthScan and uh, will probably come out later this year or early next year. And with that, uh, just please join me in thanking the panelists and Steve for his excellent presentation.